I want to dedicate today's talk in loving memory of our dear friend, Mr. Don Levitt. Don Levitt was a dear friend of mine personally, a dear friend of Torch and supporter of Torch and the patron of the Levitt Family Library. Uh, we uh, wish uh, his family only uh, thoughts and prayers in their time of mourning. And uh, we hope that his soul, because of all the good deeds that he did in his lifetime, his soul has an ascendancy in heaven. And uh, that when he's there in heaven, could pray for all of us as well. And that we should take some time to think about his character and his personality and his generosity and his vibrancy and his positive attitude and try to emulate those good characteristics that he had in our own behavior. So that we're going to dedicate the talk in his memory. In the system of Jewish courts, there are three different types of courts. There's one court comprised of three justices, and it's used to adjudicate primarily monetary and civil matters. There's a higher court composed of 23 judges, which is used for capital punishment. And the Supreme Court in Jerusalem, it has 71 judges, and its role is to arbitrate matters of national significance. The term Sanhedrin applies to both the 23 and 71 judge courts. The 23 judge court is called the small Sanhedrin, and the 71 judge court is called the great Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin Gedola. Our presentation tonight is going to be part one of the history of the Sanhedrin, and we're going to focus almost exclusively on the great Sanhedrin of 71 judges. When this court was extant, it was one of the most significant institutions of the nation, and its role in the leadership structure and hierarchy of the nation is going to increase steadily as the other offices of leadership, the monarchy, the high priesthood, the prophets are going to wane and eventually decline and end. The Great Sanhedrin was the longest lasting of these great offices of leadership. It was founded by Moshe, and it was only disbanded in the middle of the 4th or the middle of the 5th century, depending on which, uh, on which of the historical data we follow. So it had a remarkable and astonishing 17 to 1800 year run. So this presentation, we're going to try to capture a little bit of the history, the significance, the role, the modus operandi of this great institution over the years. So the first place that the precursor of the great Sanhedrin appears in the Torah is before the nation is even founded, before the Exodus. In chapter 3 of the book of Exodus, uh, verse 16. This is during Moshe's negotiations with God at the burning bush. And God tells him, go and gather the elders of Israel and tell them that God appeared to you. And he sent you to go negotiate with Pharaoh to take the Jews out of the land of Egypt from their oppression, from their enslavement. And they should join you in your first meeting with Pharaoh. And after a very lengthy back and forth, Moshe agrees to undertake this mission. He meets Aaron. They convene all the elders of Israel. That's in, ver in chapter, end of chapter 4 of Exodus. They do all the miracles that God sends with them. And everyone accepts it. Everyone gets very excited. This is the salvation that we've heard about in our tradition, that God's going to save us from the land of Egypt. And they all bow down before God and all thank God, we're on. We're in. We're going to do this mission. And they head out to meet Pharaoh. And then the beginning of chapter 5, it tells that Moshe and Aaron enter Pharaoh's chambers and start asking him to send the Jewish people out. And Rashi points out, wait a minute, they started off, it was Moshe and Aaron and all the elders of Israel, yet when they actually encounter Pharaoh, it's Moshe and Aaron and no one else. And Rashi says what actually happened was these elders, they got cold feet along the way. They were nervous when to walk into the palace and demand from the dictator to let us go with absolutely no leverage. And they just decided, not for me. I don't want to endanger my family, myself, 
and they dropped out, and only Moshe and Aaron were actually there for the first of many fateful encounters with Pharaoh. What this shows us that even while the Jewish people were enslaved in Egypt, they weren't entirely leaderless, even before Moshe. They had a collection of elders who were rep- who represented them and who the people looked up to and maybe had some clout uh, when speaking to Pharaoh as representatives of the nation. Now, the next time that these elders or elders, and we don't know if they're the same elders, but in all likelihood they are, they're given the same name, the next time they appear is at Sinai. And, and at that time we're told, this is chapter 24 of Exodus, verse 1, Moshe is told by the Almighty, you and Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadav and Avihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, come ascend the mountain and bow down to God. But bow down to God from a distance. Now this actually, even though it appears in the Torah, after the Sinai experience, according to most of the commentaries, it actually happened beforehand. We know the Torah is not necessarily written in chronological order. Uh, so here we see that there's 70 elders, and Moshe obviously knows who these people are, and he gathers them to go up the mountain for like a test run to bow down before God a few days before the Sinai experience. And the verse goes on to continue, and it says that Moshe and Aaron and Nadav and Avihu, Aaron's two sons, and the 70 elders of Israel went up the mountain. And they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet... Of course, what that means is a great mystery. But under his feet, they saw what looked like bricks. And God did not strike the leaders of Israel, even though they saw God and they ate and they drank. So if you read the verses, just without any commentary, it seems very strange. What actually happened? Rashi explains that these elders of Israel, they didn't fully appreciate the magnitude of this encounter. They were coming to meet God or God's presence on the mountain and they were eating and drinking. There's nothing wrong with eating and drinking. But to munch on a sandwich when you're in the presence of God, when you're amidst prophecy, is a little bit, it's inappropriate. And therefore, God actually says, I I didn't strike them. I'm not going to strike them even though they're worthy of dying and indeed they're going to die, but not... Right now, not in in the middle, amidst the ecstasy and the joy and the excitement of Sinai, we're going to hold it off for a little bit so that way it doesn't mar the momentous occasion of Sinai. So a year later, in chapter 11 of the book of Numbers, this is when the Jewish people finally leave Sinai. They were at the foot of the mountain for almost a year, 10 days short of a year, studying Torah from Moshe. Now they're leaving, and once they leave, all kinds of bad things start to happen. They escape, like children fleeing from school. They complain about the manna. They're scared of walking into the barren wilderness. And God sends a fire, a heavenly fire, to the edge of the camp and consumes some of the malcontents. And Rashi tells us that among them were the original 70 elders who had been chewing on that proverbial sandwich At Sinai, they had to die, but until they left Sinai, it didn't actually happen. So now there's a need to appoint fill-ins, replacements for these 70 elders that died and that they're going to be at Moshe's side and assist him in leading the nation. Now concurrently, Moshe, this is again chapter 11 of the book of Numbers, Moshe tells God, this is too much for me. I'm single-handedly trying to take care of this whole nation the way a nurse takes care of a baby, I need some help. And God says, okay, we're going to get you some help. And in chapter 11, verse 16 of Numbers, Hashem tells Moshe, gather for me 70 men from the elders of Israel that you know about them, that they're the elders of Israel, but they're also the enforcers of Israel, which means that they, these were the people who were the taskmasters of the Jews when they were enslaved. And these were the people that bore the brunt of the Egyptian aggression because they were representing 
the slaves, and when the slaves didn't perform, they beat up the taskmasters. So because these people had absorbed the blows intended for Jews, they demonstrated their readiness for leadership, choose them to head this new convention of elders, and bring them to the Mishkan, and they should stand there by the Mishkan with you, and I'm going to descend, says God, and speak to you over there, and I'm going to increase from the spirit that I give to you, and I'm going to give leftovers to give to them, which is God's way of saying, I'm going to give them all prophecy, and then they will lift with you the burden of the nation. You shouldn't have to do it on your own. So here we see this idea. God tells Moshe, go get 70 elders. 70 plus Moshe is 71. And that's going to be members of this body that are going to be the leadership of the people. Now, all the commentaries explain that there's this, this number is not insignificant. It's not like they picked the number out of the hat. It could have been 42 and ended up being 70. And all, they, all the commentaries explain... Uh, some suggest that it references the 70 Jews that descended with Jacob to enter the land of, e- uh, land of Egypt, so 70 plus 1. There's the 70 nations. There's the 70 languages. Some commentaries talk about 70 angels surrounding God's throne. I saw the Balhaturim, he writes that there's 70 names that God is called by. But this is obviously a very significant number, and it wasn't a, just an arbitrary selection. Now, it's really interesting, the process of how these people were selected. So there was a problem. If you need 70 elders plus Moshe to make 71, well, there's 12 tribes. And 10 of the tribes can contribute six members, but two of the tribes will only be able to give five members because to get to 70... You don't have an even number to, that's divisible by 12. So there's going to be, or at least there's a concern that maybe there's going to be some allegations of unfairness. So Moshe did, he selected six qualified candidates from each tribe for a grand total of 72. But you have to whittle that down to 70. So he took 72 papers, and on 70 of them, he wrote the word zakain, which means elder. And two were left blank. And he gathered the candidates around the Mishkan, and they're going to have a selection process. They're going to pick, the, pick a paper out of the hat, and that's kind of God choosing. It's not Moshe. He, he, he did not interfere with this process. And immediately with the nomination, these elders are going to be imbued, like God said earlier, they're going to be imbued with prophecy, and they're going to be ordained by Moshe to be part of this new body. Now, the Torah tells an interesting story. There were two candidates. Names were Eldad and Medad. And they, in their humility, were so certain that they were unworthy of receiving prophecy. So they decided not to join the selection process and to avoid being ashamed when they had to pick blank papers. So they stayed in the camp with the rest of the Jewish nation and didn't go around the Mishkan to be there to partake in the selection process. But the truth is that two other candidates picked blank papers and amidst the people in the camp, Eldon and Medad, they're now prophets. And they start talking and they say in front of everyone, Moshe is going to die and Joshua is going to lead us into the land, which is very shocking because this is not, this is way before the decree that all the Jews are going to die in the desert, none of them are going to make it to Israel. And Joshua, who is Moshe's apprentice and his going to be future successor, is greatly disturbed by this. And he tells Moshe, we have to destroy them. And Moshe says to them, no, 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 don't worry about my honor. These are real prophets. And if only the whole nation could be as meritorious as them to be worthy of receiving prophecy. So this body is going to be the first Sanhedrin, and it's going to continue in in various different ways, but for uh, more than a millennia and a half. Now, what's the role of this great Sanhedrin? What what do they need to do? So it's interesting. We typically think of a court as required to adjudicate law. And I think if we give that definition to the Sanhedrin, that doesn't really really tell the whole story. Because first of all, right after Sinai happened, 
this is already in the book of Exodus, Moshe's father-in-law shows up. And he sees Moshe judging the whole nation. And he gives him a suggestion to create vast networks of lower judges to teach the nation and masters of 10, 50, 100, and 1,000. Every 10 people, 50 people, 100 people, and 1,000 people will have one leader. And only the most difficult questions will make their way back to Moshe. So if the role of the Sanhedrin was to teach and to adjudicate halacha, that was already taken care of earlier. Instead, the Sanhedrin was there to assist Moshe in leading the nation and judging matters of national importance. Now, in the Talmud and in the Mishnah, there's a list of eight different kinds of cases. In the beginning of the book of Sanhedrin, eight different cases that can only be judged by the Sanhedrin themselves. Number one, if you want to judge an entire tribe, can only be done by the Sanhedrin. Number two, if you want to judge a false prophet, only can be done by the Sanhedrin, by the great Sanhedrin. Number three, if you want to judge a high priest, again, these are people who are of national, these are cases that are of national significance, and therefore you need the Sanhedrin. Number four, if you want to have a optional war, there's two kinds of war. There's voluntary war, optional ones, and then there's mandatory wars. An optional war, it can only be done in consultation with the king and the Sanhedrin. In addition, if you want to make lower courts, courts of 23 justices throughout the Jewish world, that can only be done by the directive of the great Sanhedrin. If you want to expand the area of the temple or the boundaries of the city of Jerusalem, you need to have the Sanhedrin. And finally, the Mishnah concludes, if you want to make an ear hanidachas, which is a city that the entire city committed idolatry, and you judge the city as a single entity, that, again, can only be done by this great Sanhedrin. But the Rambam adds a few more rules from other places in the Talmud. King, how are kings appointed? By the Sanhedrin. What do you do when you judge a renegade judge? If there's a judge who goes awry, has to be judged by the Sanhedrin. Uh, and two more, to administer the bitter wars of the Sota. And lastly, when there's a corpse found between two cities, you have to measure to which city it's closer to, and that city has to bring a special sacrifice. That is done by the Sanhedrin. So we see all these interesting cases that are not normal cases of people arguing uh, about financial or even criminal or civil matters, even cases of capital punishment. These are all these unique situations which are of significant Uh, national importance, they're judged by this great Sanhedrin. But even more important than these instances, the Sanhedrin had an even more fundamental role. And I think we could argue that this body was tasked with the most important and vital and sacred and critical responsibility of our nation. And that is to safeguard the integrity of the oral Torah tradition. As we know, the Torah was given to us in two formats. A written format, which is a, an encrypted version of Torah, and an oral format, which is a decrypted version of Torah. And together, the written and oral Torah complete the corpus of, of Torah itself, of what the Almighty wants from us, and... Only with these two together, if they're uncorrupted, can we perpetuate Torah to future generations. What is the last line of defense of the oral Torah tradition? What is the body whose mission is to preserve and ensure the accurate perpetuation of the oral Torah in perpetuity? That is the Sanhedrin. And the Torah tells us, in chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, it describes an exact case of how this actually would work out. How would this play out? It tells us, Ki yipale mimcha davar, when a matter is hidden from you, matter of judgment, between a blood and a blood, between a law and a law, between a plague and a plague, matters of dispute in your gates. What if, says the Torah, you have a dispute about a matter of law in one of your cities. You should get up and arise and go to the place that the Almighty chose, i.e. go to Jerusalem, 
and you should come to the Kohanim and to the Levites and to the judge that will be in those days, and they will teach you the matter of judgment. And you should do as per their instruction from the place that God selected, and you should guard to observe everything that they instruct you to do. Here is where the Torah tells us that the Sanhedrin has the authority to establish law and to make takanot, to make edicts, and to arbitrate between opposing, differing positions from various cities in the Jewish world. And it continues, Al pi ha-Torah asha Yerucho, in the exact fulfillment of the Torah that they instruct you, and the judgment that they tell you, you must do. You may not deviate from what the matter that they tell you, not right and not left. And the man who brazenly does not refuses to listen to this body, to this coin or to this judge, he shall surely die and you should eradicate evil from amongst the Jewish people and the whole nation should see and be warned. What it's telling us here is this is where it's stamping for all eternity the power and the authority of the Sanhedrin and the absolute nature of their right to render law. Here we're told, if there's any debate, any dispute, any question between any matter, it could be religious matter, civil matter, ritualistic matter, whatever it is, there's a dispute. One rabbi in town says the oral tradition is X. The other rabbi in town says the oral tradition is Y. They bring it up to Jerusalem. Each side presents their case in front of the great Sanhedrin, and whatever the Sanhedrin rules, whatever the 71 of the greatest scholars of the Jewish people, part of the body founded by Moshe and existing continuously uninterrupted since Moshe, whatever they decide, that becomes law and do not depart from it, not right, not left. The commentaries explain what does that mean? Even if they tell you that right is left and left is right, you must Listen to them. Even if they are wrong, they tell you they happen to come up with the wrong solution, which is unlikely, because again, these are the 71 greatest scholars in the world. But suppose in reality they were wrong and they conveyed the wrong halacha, the wrong law. It doesn't matter. And the commentaries explain, because this body is keeping our religion one, unified religion, under the flag of Torah. And it's better for us to go awry together, all make a mistake in one area, than to have all different factions of our religion, each one with their own Torah. And this is what would happen. The Talmud explains that they would come to Jerusalem and the two rabbis and all the students would all come, they have a question. And they would walk into the Temple Mount area. And there were three courts there, it wasn't just one. There was the main court, but then there was these lower courts. And the first one was at the entrance of Temple Mount. The next one was at the entrance of the temple itself. And finally, the great Sanhedrin in the Lishtas Hagazis in the marble chamber. Each court sitting in a semicircle so each member could see each other member. Plus, there's two stenographers in each court recording the arguments of either side respectively. In the middle, there's the greatest sage who's called alternatively the Rosh Hashiva or the Nasi, which is the equivalent of like Moshe, 70 plus 1. To his left is the, the, the greatest sage of the court, which is called the Afbetin, the head of the Sanhedrin, and the rest of the sages are placed in order of their greatness. And the two rabbis from the Shomron, or from Babylon, or from the northern part of Israel, that they have this major debate, they don't know what the truth is, they go to the first court. And they tell him, This is what I believe. This is what they believe. This is our proof. This is their proof. Do you know the answer to this question? Have you heard this being argued before? And if they say yes, great, matter is settled. If not, you push it up to the next court. Same thing. Each side presents their arguments. Do you know the answer? Have you heard this answer? Have you heard this matter been debated before? Yes, great. If not, then let's bring it in front of the Grand Sanhedrin. And when it's brought in front of the Grand Sanhedrin, That is the last stop. Whatever they decide, that becomes law and that becomes binding. If the rabbi who lost the argument is unwilling to relent, he goes back to his city and he still teaches the opinion against the ruling of the Sanhedrin, that is an executable offense. And this system ensured that, suppose there were mistakes, there were disagreements. Well, they could be quickly 
eliminated them. Again, there's a body whose sole responsibility is to make sure that mistakes are quickly removed from the collective knowledge and teachings of the Jewish nation. In fact, the first machlokas, the first disagreement in halacha that appears is during the times of Hillel and Shammai, which was the only time or the first time in Jewish history where there was an insufficient quorum for a Sanhedrin. Due to Herod's despotic rule, the rabbis were steered to convene together. And therefore, they had to separate into two separate yeshivas, Beis Shammai, Beis Hillel. And therefore, there wasn't a way to ensure that any questions are quickly addressed and a small amount of disagreements crept into tradition. Now, what are the qualifications to join the Sanhedrin? What, what do you need to be? What do you need to know? How do you have to operate in order to be part of this elite body of the Supreme Court of the Jewish people? So Rambam, in his Laws of Sanhedrin, which is found in the 14th book of his Yad HaZakra, a book called Shoftim, he lays out the eligibility requirements of the Sanhedrin. Number one, you have to be wise, you have to be clever, you have to be superlative Torah scholars, you have to be broad-minded. You also have to have a good baseline of knowledge in secular matters, in mathematics, in in medicine, in uh, astronomy, and even in matters of, of sin. Not that you have to have done it, but many times these kinds of laws will come before the court. So they have to know a little bit about the various kinds of idolatry that were practiced at the time, and even some of the witchcraft and all those other kinds of weird things that were were happening during those times. In addition, Kohanes, Levites, Israelites, primarily we hope to have more Kohanes, like the verse says, but if we only have Israelites, that's also fine. And this is interesting. If someone is really old, they're actually cannot be nominated to be part of the Sanhedrin. Because if they say if someone's really old, they get cranky. And they say, they're, or they're apt to say, get off my lawn. And therefore, someone like that, they can't have the mercy needed to be a proper judge. And, and similarly, it says that if someone, is, if someone is a eunuch, not a good candidate, if someone doesn't have any children, they're not trained in the ways of mercy and therefore they are not good candidates. You can't have a king be part of the Sanhedrin, even though the king sometimes is the greatest Torah star like in the case of David. But the law is you're not allowed to argue with the king. So what's going to be? You can't have 71 scholars because everyone's scared to argue with the king. Therefore, they're not invited to join the Sanhedrin, which is also the same reason why when they had the arguments back and forth, and each one of the 71 scholars would present their opinion, they'd start from the most junior of the judges because once they start with the senior one, everyone's scared to argue and maybe even not allowed to argue. Uh, in addition, they had to be physically healthy. They had, cannot be having any blemishes in their body that would render them also ineligible to be a member of the Sanhedrin. It's an interesting story. Uh, in the 20th century, one of the greatest Torah scholars that we've had was Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. And I read a story once that he was undergoing a surgery, a heart surgery of some sort. And he was very interested in the intricacies of the operation to make sure that would the temple be rebuilt tomorrow with the arrival of Messiah and they would need to have 71 members for the Sanhedrin, he would still be eligible. Uh, Because to be part of the Sanhedrin, you have to be healthy as well. You have to have uh, a certain stature, you have to be, you have to have a dignified appearance, you have to be a pleasant speaker, and you also have to know the majority of the languages or passable, passing knowledge of the languages that people speak. Because the halacha is, if you're part of Sanhedrin, you cannot have an interpreter. You have to hear from the litigants themselves, which is an, an interesting little historical anecdote. In the book of Esther, Mordechai, who was a member of the Sanhedrin, he overhears a conversation between two of Ahasuerus's servants plotting to kill him. And the Talmud tells us that the reason why he overheard it, not because he was eavesdropping, but because they thought that their native language, this, this old Jew doesn't know it, but because Mordechai was a member of the Sanhedrin, 
he learned it, and therefore he was able to save the king from this plot. And the Rambam goes on to say that they would scout out the Jewish world for talent, and they would send out messengers throughout all the land of Israel, and they would inspect anyone who's a, a rising star, a Torah scholar, but also with fear of heaven, and also with humility, and also the people really like him, and they would make him, a, first they would make him a judge in his city, and then they would promote him to the court by the entrance of Temple Mount, and then they upgrade him to the next one. And finally, they give him a slot, if he was worthy, in the Supreme Court in the Great Sanhedrin. So those are some of the requirements of to be a member of this body. But I think the most critical requirement to be part of the Sanhedrin is to have smicha. What smicha, smicha means ordination. But this begins with Moshe. Moshe ordains these 70 sages, and then he ordains Joshua. And then Joshua ordains his successor, and the rabbis and scholars that knew all of Torah in his generation. And that continued on and on for generations for 1,500, 1,600 years or so. And this had to be done like with the approval of the greatest leader of the time. And to be part of the Sanhedrin, you had to have smicha, or at least there had to be one member of the Sanhedrin who had smicha, who could give smicha to everyone else. And this is a big deal because the office of Sanhedrin, it really hinges upon the ability to have people who have smicha. And now today, we have smicha. Rabbinic ordination is called smicha as well. But because it's not uninterrupted from teacher to student, from Moshe until present times, because the Romans stopped smicha, and smicha was also only given in the land of Israel, not outside of Israel, when all the Jews left Israel, smicha ended. And if smicha ended, necessarily the Sanhedrin ended too. Of course, there were still great Torah scholars, but as a necessary precondition to be part of Sanhedrin is you have to have smicha. And essentially, uh, this body of these great scholars, from the times of Moshe, they were operating in this role carved out for them in the Torah. But for the next 800 years or so, the Sanhedrin does not appear too often in Jewish history. And I think the reason for this is, is quite simple. The Sanhedrin was a place where all they did was study Torah. There was no... They had no political role. They had no uh, fanfare. Uh, they weren't involved in, in cultural issues. Nothing. It was just Torah. In fact, there's a prohibition in the Sanhedrin to speak any other words besides for Torah. There was no idle chit-chat, nothing. It was just Torah all the time. And in fact, back to Mordechai, the Talmud in the book of Megillah tells us, uh, quoting the one of the last verses, in fact, it might be the last verse of the book of Esther, it says, that Mordechai became a viceroy to Ahasuerus, vegadol le Yehudim, veratsui lerov achav, and a great man amongst the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brethren. But the Hebrew word for this rov achav, which means the majority of his brothers, majority of his brethren, he was very popular. Says the Talmud, he was a majority, he was popular with the majority of his brothers, of his brethren, but not all of them. Why? Because some of the members of Sanhedrin, they parted from him. Why? Why would Mordechai, the hero of the Purim story, why would the members, other members of the Sanhedrin want nothing to do with him? And the answer is because of the beginning of the verse. Mordechai became a politician. He was the viceroy of Ahasuerus. And Sanhedrin is only about Torah. And therefore, they felt that he should, not, he should lose his position, take a government position, you can no longer be part of the Sanhedrin. And over these 800 years or so, the nation is being led by competent leaders, by judges, by prophets, by teens. The Sanhedrin faithfully maintained their role, doing their job and ensuring that there be no mistakes in the, perpe- perpe- in the perpetuation of the oral Torah, but they didn't really have to take the front seat. The spotlight was not on them 
until it had to be on them by necessity. So yes, it, it does appear a little bit. We talk, we, we read a little bit about Samuel and his court, and King David had a certain had a few interactions with the Sanhedrin that we know of. Uh, for example, the Talmud records that King David got saras, he got the halachic leprosy for six months, and the Sanhedrin left from left him. So obviously, there was a relationship between the leadership and the Sanhedrin, but the Sanhedrin himself itself as a body doesn't really have center stage. All that is going to change after the destruction of the first temple. At that time, roughly around the year 350, the Sanhedrin's role and indeed their body count is going to expand quite significantly. Because for about a century, in the beginning of the second temple era, the Sanhedrin is going to be called the Great Assembly, and its members are going to be called the men of the great assembly, the Anshe Knesset Gadola. In, included amongst its members are the last of their prophets, Ezra, the last of the prophets of the Jewish people, Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechari, Malachi, just to name a few. And because of the realities of the Jewish world at the time, they're going to play quite a pivotal role shaping the future of the Jewish Nation. And there's a few reasons why this shift happens, why the Sanhedrin really ascends in the totem pole of Jewish leadership. For one, the nation is, is split. For the first time since they entered the land under Joshua, for the first time really since they were founded as a nation at the Exodus, there's going to be a Jewish diaspora. There's going to be an enormous Jewish community living outside of Israel. And in fact, the majority of Jews are going to be living in Babylon. And even in Israel, there's going to be significant portions of the nation that are going to struggle with observance of Torah. There's going to be intermarriage, there's going to be Shabbos desecration. These things which were hitherto anathema are going to creep up in certain communities. But also, those other institutions and offices of leadership that really held sway in guiding and inspiring and leading the nation are going to either disappear entirely or going to become shells of their former self. So yes, they're going to rebuild the temple, but it's going to be besieged by corruption. It's going to be lacking the ever-present miracles that graced the first temple. And it's going to even be missing some of the sacred vessels, such as the Ark of the Covenant. But in addition, the office of the high priesthood, is, which was beforehand a great office of leadership leading the nation, is going to become corrupted. They're going to sell it to the highest bidder, and it can no longer be trusted to be faithful leaders of the nation. Also, the kings. In the Second Temple era, the Jewish nation will see only illegitimate Teens, and frequently these illegitimate teens are going to be Sadducees. They're going to be anti Torah and they're going to clash with the mainstream, Pharisaic, as it's called, body of the Jewish nation. So the teens can't be relied upon either. And finally, this time is going to coincide with the end of prophecy. No longer is there going to be a direct divine channel between the Jewish nation and God. And once that's lost, again, these three offices, these three institutions that led the nation, well, they're no longer reliable. And the only body that's left that hasn't lost its mojo is the Sanhedrin. So they decide to expand their body, 120 members, under the leadership and initiation of Ezra, in conjunction with the last of the prophets, and they're going to convene to ensure the survival of Judaism under such challenging conditions, and they're going to pave the way to the Judaism that we have today. And their objective, as it always is with the Sanhedrin, is ensuring the transmission of oral law and the ability of the Jewish nation to faithfully maintain Torah. So a few things that they're going to do that are really lasting. So first of all, canonizing Scripture. Once prophecy ends and the Jews are now spread out, Jews need to know which books are ours and which books are not ours, which books are approved parts of the Jewish canon and which one of them are not. So they decided which 24 books 
are included, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Tzuvim, the Tanakh, and which ones are not included. And in fact, the Talmud records that there was a dialogue between the men of the Great Assembly in Israel and Queen Esther in Persia. She, after all, was the author of the Book of Esther, and she really wanted it to be included in the corpus, and indeed it was. In addition, this Sanhedrin, this Men of the Great Assembly, they instituted, formalized, canonized prayer. Of course, it was an obligation to pray every day, even before that, but because the conditions were so, were such that some of the nation, many parts of the nation, they weren't praying properly, they didn't know how to pray, they're away, they don't visit the temple. This is a changing reality, and therefore they decided to create a formalized, fixed structure and words of prayer. We call it the Shemona Esrei, the 18 benedictions, the 18 prayers, which we still recite today. It's interesting, 400 years later, the Sanhedrin, when it's going to be located in Yavne, is going to be add the 19th blessing to their predecessors, 18, and that's, of course, the 19 blessings that we have today, even though we still call it the Shemona Esrei. Uh, and in addition, this Sanhedrin, under the leadership of Ezra, men of the Great Assembly, they're going to establish an educational system throughout the land of Israel to ensure that there is adequate Torah opportunities for all the Jewish communities. From that point forward, the role of the Sanhedrin is going to continually and steadily and progressively rise. After the men of the Great Assembly, we see the leadership in the hands of the five pairs, five sets of zugos. In chapter 1 of Pirkei Avos, we read about these ten men and split into five eras, two zugos, which means pairs, of leaders for each era. Yossi ben Yoezer, Yossi ben Yochanan, Shub ben Prach and Itai Arbeili, Yehuda ben Tabai, Shem ben Shetach, Shmaya and Aftalion, and finally Hillel and Shammai. These five pairs, these five zugos, one of them was the Nasi, the president of the Sanhedrin. One of them is the Afbetin, the head of the Sanhedrin. And these are the two true leaders of the generation. Comes along Herod. What does Herod do? Herod goes on a campaign to assassinate rabbis and make living as a Jew almost impossible. And, after, and he walks around masquerading as a Jewish king. He gives off the impression, even though his claim to being Jewish was quite dubious, and certainly his behavior as a Jew was unwarranted of any Jewish person, certainly not a Jewish leader. But he walks around and says, oh, I'm the Jewish king. You don't like it. I'll, I'll gouge out your eyes. And the Sanhedrin made a strategic decision. And they said, oh, he thinks he's the king? We're going to now take the Nasi, the head of the Sanhedrin, the number one, not the number two, the Afbet, the number one, the, the Nasi, the equivalent of Moshe, and we're going to make him like a king. And therefore, we're going to select only people who are direct descendants of King David and actual legitimate kings if they were nominated to be so. And thus, Hillel becomes the first of this new kind of Nasi. The Nasi that's not just the Torah leader of the Sanhedrin, but the religious political leader that is the true representative of the people and the wishes of the people. And from that point forward, the office of the Nasi is going to be in direct descendants of Hillel, and it's going to last for as long as the Sanhedrin lasts, the, they're going to be headed by a direct descendant of Hillel and King David. But like we mentioned earlier, during this time, under Herod's leadership, something happened that never happened prior. Because they were scared of Herod's famous anger, and paranoia, and the fact that he assassinated thousands of rabbis already, the Sanhedrin, headed by Hillel and Shammai, decided to split up. Then I have one major Sanhedrin with all the great sages, 71, plus 23, plus 23, everyone there, this is the epicenter of Jewish life. They split up. There was a base Shammai, and there was a base Hillel. In the temple, they kept the minimum quorum necessary, but no longer was it all united under one roof. And that allowed for disagreements to not be easily remedied and easily answered and easily solved. And therefore, the beginning of disagreements 
began to creep in. And even though soon after they reunited in one national assembly, but there were still differences of opinion, there was still a lingering Beishamai and Beishillel amongst the members of the Sanhedrin. And that continued until after the Second Temple was destroyed and the Sanhedrin reconvened in Yavne and spent a significant time bringing these various factions together and, of course, as we know, ruling that the Halacha follows Beis Hillel. Now, the first century was a very challenging one for the Jewish people. Specifically, like we're told in the Talmud, because there are so many different factions and groups and sects and all these different ideas swirling about in Judea as to who should be the leadership of the people and what should be the priorities of the Jewish nation. Plus, we have the Roman aggressor always looming above us, and that created all kinds of problems. Talmud point Talmud counts 24 different sects of Jewish people, of Jewish, of, of Jewish groups, each one of them kind of on their own and at war with the other ones. Of course, the mainstream, the majority of Jews were, were, were what are called uh, by Josephus Pharisees or Prussian, which means, Prussian means those that abstain, which all that means is they abstain from all the new innovations. They were just the same Jews all, all the way back to Moshe. But of course, when, you know, if I, if I change, I become a Sadducee, I have to give a name to everyone else who doesn't become a Sadducee. They, they're called the Prussian. But there were also these these like gangs of of Jewish groups that were fighting with each other and killing each other. And there was so much crime and violent crime and homicide in Judea that the Sanhedrins in various cities, the lower courts, were busy every day getting cases of capital punishment. And they made a decision to voluntarily weaken its power. Now, the Talmud set tells us, based upon the verse in Deuteronomy, that the power of the great Sanhedrin extends beyond its courtroom walls. All the minor Sanhedrins in the whole Jewish world, they only have their mandate to do any form of justice if and so long as the temple is extant and if and so long as the great Sanhedrin is on the premises of the temple grounds. Therefore, what's, what, what happens if the Sanhedrin decides to abdicate, to leave the temple grounds that immediately handcuffs every Sanhedrin in the entire land, they can no longer adjudicate certain cases like capital crime. And because there was an uptick in violent crime in those decades preceding the destruction of the temple, 40 years before the temple is destroyed, so according to most, that would be the year 30 of the Common Era, the Sanhedrin decided to move out of the temple itself to a different area on the temple grounds and eventually to a different area in Jerusalem, specifically with the intent of disallowing all courts to do capital punishment cases. Now, it's kind of ironic because if there's an increase in crime, you would think that we should have more courts, not fewer courts. So why did they make that decision? I think it does show us how the Sanhedrin view themselves. Jewish courts are not there to compel observance. Rather, they're there as a safety measure to strengthen and to buttress a nation that already observes. If the nation demonstrates that now we want the Sanhedrin to keep us in line and to make sure that we keep Torah, that's not the role of the Sanhedrin. In fact, the Talmud says that a court should be ha- should have a case of capital punishment once every seven or once every 70 years. It's astonishingly rare. If it's more prevalent than that, they have to close up shop because that is not the nation that these laws were intended for. Now, it's interesting. This is perhaps a subject of a different talk. But according to the allegation that the Jewish court of law killed the Christian savior in the year 34, well, we know from our sources that Jewish courts were not administering justice in capital crime cases from the year 30 onward. 
So it's a question you'll have to answer. And I have maybe we could talk about this in some other some other podcast. Uh, but if the Jews were not adjudicating capital crime, how could they have killed the Christian hero? Regardless, separate discussion. Sanhedrin leaves their perch in the temple grounds and they move outside and then they move to outside of Jerusalem and they're going to relocate nine different times and the exact travels of the Sanhedrin are recorded in the Talmud, the book of Rosh Hashanah, on page 31a. By the time the Great Revolt happens in the year 66 and the Romans lay siege to Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin is outside of Jerusalem entirely and they are seeking refuge in the coastal city of Yavne. There's a great story brought down in the Talmud in the book of Gittin that the elder sage, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, he's the sage of Jerusalem. And the conditions inside the city are deplorable. There's mass starvation. People are dying. People are foraging outside the city and they're being crucified by the Romans. It's a really terrible state of affairs. And Rabbi Yochanan Zakkai smuggles himself out of the city. He pre- pretends to be dead and they put him in a coffin and they bring him out to the city and he has a meeting with Vespasian, who's the Roman general, soon to be emperor, uh, who's overseeing the siege. And he has a conversation with him. And after impressing him uh, quite dramatically, he tells him, okay, make three requests. And the first request that he asked for, Tainli Yavne V'chachamea, give me the city of Yavne and its sages. Spare the Sanhedrin that's now situated in Yavne. And, of course, we can second-guess his decision because Rabbi Yochanan Zakkai does not ask that Jerusalem be spared, but it seems likely that he knew and he calculated that Vespasian already set his mind to, to destroy Jerusalem and maintaining a strong Torah center in Yavne will ensure that the Jews don't wither away and we can rebuild after the looming destruction. And indeed, that's what happened. Jerusalem was destroyed, but Yavne was spared. Rabbi Yochum Zakkai himself traveled to Yavne, and he was uh, well past 100 years old at the time, but he was there for only a few short months to years until he voluntarily left to make way for the young Nasi, the great-grandson of Hillel, Rabban Gamliel, Rabban Gamliel II, Rabban Gamliel of Yavne, who is going to have massive challenges facing him. The temple is destroyed. The nation is in shambles. The halachic friction between the schools of Shammai and Hillel have yet to be resolved. And the menace of Roman aggression and oppression is still very much looming overhead. And the next time, we will see how the Sanhedrin navigated these grave challenges.